بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد So this is the Islam for Life series which we had began last year with the Sakina Collective uh, During the course of last year we actually looked at uh, discrete topics each week uh, not from necessarily a, a jurisprudential or fiqh perspective only but also looking from a general perspective, a spiritual perspective this included uh, things like marriage, like divorce like raising children uh, like uh, interaction between males and females who are unmarried, um, dealing with one's uh, wealth and finances and Islamic perspective on things uh, of this nature. So this uh, semester we'll be looking at, for the Islam for Life series, jurisprudence of ritual devotions, or what's commonly referred to in Arabic as fiqh al-ibadat, how we go about to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, we'll start the slide uh, presentation for that. And when we talk about fiqh or uh, understanding, it comes from a, an original Arabic word meaning to understand something. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu in one of the Mu'allaqat al-Bukhari, one of the chapter headings of Bukhari said, من يرد به خيرا يفقهه في الدين. Whenever Allah wants good of His slave or His servant, then He gives them fiqh of the deen, which is understanding of the deen. So it doesn't mean fiqh in the sense that I know the halal and the haram only, but actually internalizing the meanings of halal and haram, internalizing the meanings of trying to please Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, internalizing the meanings of ubudiyah or servitude to God only. Um, when we talk about fiqh in its more uh, specialist sense, when we say in the terminology of the fiqh, then it has a different definition. And we know that many of the words, for example, that were introduced fi sadr islam in the beginning of Islam, uh, didn't have those meanings when the Prophet Sallallahu came to uh, begin his mission. So words like salah or prayer didn't mean the prayer of ruku'ah and sujood and qiyam and standing up and fatiha that the meaning later took on. Words like zakat, right, didn't have that meaning. Um, hajj, interestingly enough, did have that meaning because hajj was known to the Arabs before Islam, but not in the exact manner by which the Prophet ﷺ instructed the Sahaba to make hajj when he said to them, خُذُوا مَنَاسِكَكُمْ عَنِّي right? Take the manasik of the hajj, the rites of hajj as you see me doing them. So after that, the ulama developed a specialist terminology to try to convey the meanings of the Qur'an and Sunnah um, as these meanings expanded. So in the terminology of the Sharia, it means knowledge of the practical legal rulings that are derived from specific textual evidence, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Right? Someone might ask, why don't you just take your fiqh from the Qur'an and Sunnah? Why do you need to have this terminology and ulama? And, you know, it seems like a barrier or it seems like something that may be unnecessary when I can just open up the pages of the Qur'an or the pages of uh, Hadith Bukhari or Muslim and so forth, and then I can um, follow those meanings. So we can follow those meanings straight from the Qur'an or straight from the Hadith. And what people fail to see in that is, yes, during the time of the Sahaba or even during the time of the Prophet Wasallam, he was the sole source of the Sharia. So if the Sahaba had a question, they could directly ask the Prophet ﷺ. When he told them how to do something, he would say, Sallu kama usalli. Pray as if you see me praying. And so the Sahaba prayed as they saw the, the Prophet ﷺ praying. But then after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, and we had many of these companions, right, 10,000 companions, uh, from those 10,000, maybe less than 100 were, you could say, of... Uh, the sort who were able to understand the Qur'an and Sunnah in a sense that they can read it and then they can practice it and derive rulings from it. Right? So out of 10,000 Sahaba, not all of them were able to do that. Many of them were just merely narrators of the Islamic traditions. In other words, they narrated the things that Prophet Sallallahu said. Right? And the Prophet Sallallahu he indicated this. He said, رُبَّ حَمَلِ فِلْقٍ لَيْسَ بِفَقْلِي وَرُبَّ حَمَلِ فِلْقٍ إِلَى مَا هُوَ أَفْقَهُ مِنْ Perhaps someone hamil al fiqh, someone who is carrying the fiqh, in other words, the hadith narrations, laysa bi faqih, is not someone who can actually interpret and understand them. 
And perhaps someone who is carrying these traditions will be taking it to someone who is afqah, who is, has ability to understand better than he does. Right? Imam al-Shafi'i used to say that I depend on Sheikh Ahmed ibn Hanbal for the hadith, right? in terms of that he brings those, um, the hadith in terms of narrations, but Imam al-Shafi'i was a faqih. In other words, he was someone who was able to derive the understanding of how to go about living our life directly from the Qur'an and Sunnah. So it takes a, a certain caliber of person. Um, we talked about this in one of our classes last year, I believe the Gateways and, and Boundaries class, and we said that there are certain conditions of, of Arabic language, of understanding, of uh, piety, of knowing the prophetic traditions, knowing the aqwad uh, al-Sahaba, the opinions of the Sahaba. In other words, knowing kind of all of the rules that are associated with um, applying those jurisprudential rules to deriving the Qur'an and Sunnah directly from, uh, from the Qur'an and Sunnah. But if you're not of that caliber, if you're not there, in other words, you don't have a lifetime to devote and dedicate to learning these things, and probably in our age you'd need a few lifetimes to do it, then you are someone who needs to follow someone who is. So if you're unqualified to do it, then you need someone to follow someone who is qualified. Many of the people who are kind of... Um, promoting this slogan of Qur'an and Sunnah only and, and forget about the madhahib and forget about the ulama, they themselves are following someone else. They didn't come up with that all by themselves. They're following someone who said that. So whether they like to admit it or not, they indeed are following someone as well. It's not like they're deriving it directly for themselves, right? How can they when many of them don't even speak the Arabic language or don't have a basic understanding of Arabic? Not, impos- not possible to derive from the Qur'an and Sunnah. So that means that we need to follow people who are qualified. Um, just like the way that we know the Qur'an, right? Some people think, you know, we're kind of uh, removed from how the Qur'an actually is authenticated because when you get the Mus'haf and you open the pages and you just say, oh, Qur'an, it's there. But actually, it's a, a not dissimilar process went into how the Qur'an reached us in the same way the fiqh. Uh, uh, we understand it, how it reached us. So for the Qur'an, there were narrators, right? And those narrators or reciters of the Qur'an, had many reciters take from them, and so forth, until um, we had seven canonical recitations. Right? There used to be more than that. Ibn Mujahid said there were 50 at one point. Just like at one point there were 50 madhahib, 50 fiqh uh, uh, madhabs, and we'll talk about madhab in a second, um, or, or rule, schools of law. And so these things got sort of dwindled down by a natural process, that went back to the students that studied the particular school of law, who dedicated themselves to it, how it was spread. There was also political and social and cultural uh, context to how these things remained. But it was such that the nature of the Qur'an has reached us in seven, and some later added three more, so ten canonical recitations of the Qur'an. So if you recite any other recitation besides these ten, it's not Qur'an. It's something else. And in our day and age, if you have any other madhab if you're from Ahl sunnah other than the four, then you don't have a madhab from Ahl sunnah you have something else. So uh, these four particular schools, namely the ones of Abu Hanifa and Nu'man, and uh, Sayyidina Imam Malik ibn Anas, and Imam al-Shafi, Hamid ibn Idris, and uh, Sayyidina Ahmed ibn Hanbal, these were the four that Allah SWT chose to preserve until our time. Uh, there were others, there was the Sufyanayn, Sufyan al-Thawri, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, there was al awzai there was al Laith ibn Sa'd, uh, amongst others. But the people who studied with them did not take it to the point where it became something that became sort of a, a permanent fixture of how we understand the Sharia. So there were schools of thought that died out, like al Zahiriya, for example. Uh, the Zahiri school of thought also was something that was around for a while and it died out. So these are the four that are there. And it's the means and the way by which we understand the Qur'an and Sunnah. And madhab, all it means is that the particular juristic rulings or methodology is applied in one school may differ somewhat from one in another school. And as a result, there will be differences of opinion, which go back to differences of opinion amongst the Sahaba, as we mentioned. The companions themselves, many of them saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pray, right? Because he said, pray as you see me pray. But then they saw him pray, and then each one, or some of them, may differ about how he actually prayed. So some of them said that he used to raise his hands, some of them said he didn't raise his hands, some of them said that he would go down 
for the sujood with his knees first, some said with his hands first. So who's right? Well, there's no right and wrong, because if we authenticate the narration, and we say this is an authentic narration, and this is an authentic narration, there is a methodology about how we combine those understandings, right? Or, or what seem to be dissimilar narrations about the same event. And depending upon your school of thought, right, whether it's a Maliki or a Shafi or Hanbali or Hanafi, you will have a different approach about how you try to reconcile what seems to be different opinions. So Abu Hanifa, for example, he will say that if the companion who narrates the hadith doesn't actually practice that, right, like he says Ibn Mas'ud, he narrates the hadith of raising the hands uh, during some parts of the prayer. But he also didn't do it himself. So he understood from this that it was something that was either abrogated or the Prophet Sallallahu did maybe once or twice, but not something regularly. And so his school of thought, his opinion, is that one does not raise their hands except in the beginning. Takbirat al-Ihram, muhakkada. So there are, are, are different uh, methodologies that, which are very, I would say, a little bit complicated. I don't want to go too much into it now, but I'm just trying to give you an introduction to, you know, why we're studying it in this particular way. And I know many of you are already kind of beyond past that point, but I think... Uh, you know, there's just to remind myself and others that hopefully there will be some benefit to be reminded of this. So when we say about Sharia, um, fiqh is our window into the Sharia. It's something that's part of it. It's not something separate from it. And the reason I make this point is because uh, there are some with academic backgrounds who make the assertion that, well, you know, the Sharia is this kind of uh, very ideal system. Uh, that you can't really actually know, and then fiqh is this man-made apparatus that has so many faults in it, so maybe you could just dump the whole thing. But the way that we understand the sharia is the fiqh, just like the way we know the Qur'an is via al-qira'at. And they both have human aspects to them. So to, to make the assertion that because some type of human interaction is involved, and then we dump the whole thing is, is a fallacious argument. Um, so, fiqh is our way of understanding the sharia. So, we can say with complete confidence that anyone who follows a madhab, one of the four, or chooses to take different opinions from within the four schools, then they're following the sharia. Right? And I would say to them, unless you are a mujtahid mutlaq, unless you are an absolute mujtahid, you're not going to be able to understand the... Um, uh, the Sharia, except by these four schools. So you have to be of the caliber of someone who can actually derive the Quran and Sunnah, the rules yourself, but if you're not, then you can't understand them. We had, a, uh, we had a minor technical difficulty with the live stream. We're just going to try one fix quickly, inshallah. Time. Work. I'm just going to uh, yeah, correct. Yep. And uh, the keynote. So apologies to those who are following on the live stream, we kind of lost the link, but um, what we're saying is that fiqh is, fiqh is intrinsic to the sharia, and it's our way of understanding the sharia, and in the same manner that qira'at, or the um, human 
canonical narrations of the Qur'an is the way we understand the Qur'an. So this kind of holding up this ideal that there is this very idealistic way that we can understand the deen that ha- involves no human interaction, uh, it's a fallacious argument, number one, and it's, it's simply not possible. So Allah SWT chose to preserve this deen via people. Right? When he says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ We have sent down the dhikr, the remembrance, and we have preserved it. So Allah has preserved it, right? But He has also ensured that this preservation would go on via multiple generations until the last days, and this has been via people themselves. So Allah has put that ability within the people to preserve it. Whereas He did not give that ability to previous umam, other nations before us. When they were entrusted with preserving it by themselves, and they did not. But for us, Allah entrusted us, but also He uh, you know, He is the one who took it upon Himself, so to speak, to preserve the deen. So fiqh, as relates to other sciences, especially the, the uh, internal sciences of tasqiyat and nafs, um, is something that is indispensable. So, haqiqah and sharia, the outer forms and inner meanings, the outer form being the sharia, the inner meanings being the haqiqah, uh, you cannot understand or receive one without going through the other. So there is no haqiqah without sharia. Um, and if you are following the sharia, then you, inshallah you'll find the haqiqah. That is the way to it. And this is completely in contrast. There are people who previously used to say things like, you know, we've kind of arrived, we don't need to follow so religiously the, the devotional acts, we don't need to pray as often and so forth, that's for the awam, that's for people who, you know, don't have these kind of internal uh, realizations of meanings, this is nonsense. Imam Junaid, when he was told about these people, he said they've arrived, but they've arrived to hell. Uh, so there is always this relationship, a balanced one between the internalization of the higher meanings with following the outer forms. Because it's our belief that the outer forms, they themselves are what lead to the inner meanings. Right? When you pray like the Prophet ﷺ prayed, and hajj, make hajj like he does, and choose not to speak, and to avoid backbiting and slandering, and all these things the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to do, this will lead to a, uh, illumination. This will lead to an enlightenment of the soul. Right? So it, the sharia is the only way. That is the path. So following the sharia is the tariqah, it's the way that leads to the haqiqah, to the higher meanings. Imam al-Ghazali put it in this way, he said, you begin with knowledge, in other words, knowledge of knowing the outer forms, knowing the ahkam, the rulings of the devotional act, and uh, then you have amal, then you actually have to put that into practice, you can't just stop there, and the one you put it into practice, then Allah will give you knowledge of that which you do not know. Right? Similar to the saying, من عمل بما علم أورث الله علم ما لم يعلم. Whoever uh, puts into practice that which he knows, and Allah will give him knowledge of what he does not know. What تَقُلْ الله ويعلمكم الله. You know, have fear and acknowledgement of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, His maqam, and Allah will give you knowledge of that which you do not know. Sometimes referred to as an علم الدنيا, or knowledge that can only come from uh, direct divine uh, realization that comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala directly. This can come in the way of dreams, it can come in the way of uh, epiphanies, it can come in many forms, but it's things that you can't normally avail yourself of just from reading books or from even sitting with a teacher. But they are the keys by which one can avail themselves of these things. So as I mentioned, the madhab uh, comes from the word dhahaba, which means to go, so it's a place where you go. Right, or how to go. So madhab, all it is, is the way by which you can get to the sharia, as we mentioned. Majority of legal evidence is equivocal or dhanni in nature. In other words, specifically for the kind of very intricate details of many acts of worship. You know, jumlatan, in, in a general sense, prayer is an obligation. There's no like madhab difference about that. But, you know, the intricate details of... Um, you know, when you forget something in prayer, should you do the sujood before you do the taslim, before the salam, or after the salam, and, and things like this, which are more of a detailed nature, which clearly won't be addressed by in that level of detail in the Qur'an, and in many instances, maybe not that level of detail in the direct hadith either. 
So then this would require what we call ishtihad. It would require for the mujtahid, the one who is equipped to do so, to de- derive these rulings from the Qur'an and Sunnah and the Qiyas and the Ijma' and the Usul, you know, the, the sources of legislation that, that they do. So most of the evidence in the Sharia or in the Fiqh is of this nature. You know, the things that are kind of unequivocal and there's no difference of opinion about it are kind of the, you can think of that as the anchors of the Sharia, right? Where we draw the boundaries, right? We, used to, we said that the Ijma', the consensus of the scholars, is where the boundaries of Islam are. And then outside of those boundaries is no more Islam. So that's why Mukhalaf al Ijma', someone who goes outside the Ijma' that says uh, praying the five prayers is an obligation. So if someone were to make a claim that they're a scholar and at the same time they say, well, I think there's six prayers that are obligatory. Or I think we don't have to do them when we live in America because it's you know, hard or whatever. Then um, we would say this is Mukhalaf al Ijma'. This is not only going against the Ijma', the consensus of the Ulama, but it goes against. Nas al Quran, right? It goes against the actual text, unequivocal text of the Quran, so it would be rejected. However, most of the things in fiqh or in, or in jurisprudence are not of that nature. So that's why we have a difference of opinion. So the four madhabs, as we mentioned, they represent over 1,000 years of scholarship, and within each madhab, in each generation, there may be hundreds of thousands of scholars. So we're talking about something that has been under a constant review process by many, many scholars for many, many centuries. So when we say Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, we're not saying that single person. They're just kind of the fountainhead. But they're not everything, right? In fact, many of the ulama who came after them, even their direct students actually differed with them. Like the uh, Sahiban, like Abu Yusuf and Muhammad al Hassan al Shaybani, sometimes they differed with Abu Hanifa. Imam al Shafi was a student of Malik, actually, and obviously he differed. Ahmed al Muhammad was a student of a Shafi, and he also differed with him. So they were, while they were all connected, they also reached uh, different uh, methodologies based upon what, you know, what Allah SWT guided them to. And it's all acceptable because it's within kind of the, level, the realm of acceptance because it's about things that are not unequivocal. It's about things that can have a difference in opinion. So all of our actions should conform to at least one of the madhabs on any given issue. Right? If you want to play, to play the salama and the safe side, try to follow or have all of your actions, in fact, it's an obligation to have all of your actions fall within one of the four. Do you have to do a single one every time? Not necessarily, but at least one of the four, anything you do. So if you're wudu, make sure you make your wudu correctly on one of the four madhabs. Your prayer, one of the four. Your hajj, you know, your buying and selling, your transactional things, your marriage contract. At least have it valid according to one of uh, the four schools, right? And the ulama have a term for mixing and matching called talfiq, which means to kind of take a little bit of this one, take a little bit of that one. And some of them, uh, the Manichis especially, kind of were more lenient in that, ex- except they said in certain situations you should definitely avoid it, like marriage, for example. Because if you do talfiq in marriage, if you follow, for example, uh, the Maliki opinion that does not require two witnesses right at the outset, right, but it requires it at least ishtihar, which is that it's announced in some way, and if you follow the Hanafi, which says that you don't have to have a guardian, right, for the, for the bride, so no witnesses, no guardian, right, because if you're mixing and matching now, now all you have is just the, uh, the groom and the bride, so that doesn't sound like marriage to me, right, because you don't have a sort of societal check and balance to go with that. So it's just two people who get together and decide, you know, without anything else, we're going to get married. Um, but if you follow the Hanafi and you do without a guardian, then you're going to have the witnesses. And if you follow the Maliki and you don't have witnesses at the outset, but you have a guardian and then the witnesses come later, then you're following at least one of the schools of thought uh, in its entirety to ensure that the marriage is valid. So that's something that's important. They also mentioned in, uh, like, uh, wudu is another thing, or uh, when you're preparing to pray. So if you take mix and match, you can also wind up not having wudu uh, valid on any school of thought. So if you follow the uh, the, uh, uh, the Hanafi opinion that says touching a member of the opposite sex with your uh, bare hand on skin uh, does not nullify the wudu as it does in the Shafi school, but then uh, you also follow the Shafi school in that blood that breaks the skin if you bleed doesn't nullify, even though it nullifies in the Hanafi, 
and you mix those two together, you unite, so let's say you bleed, and you touch a member of the opposite sex. So, you, and you could say, well, in the Hanafi school, touching a member of the opposite sex doesn't break my wudu. And in the Shafi school, bleeding doesn't break my wudu. But you don't have wudu according to any of them, right? Because you mixed and matched. So your wudu is neither valid in the Shafi school, nor is it valid in the Hanafi school. So this is the kind of thing that they, they, they warned about. It's always preferable to learn a particular madhab. I would say serious students of knowledge, that's the way they should go. Uh, it just facilitates things instead of worrying about what does this school say and what does that school say. Much in the same way someone wants to learn Quran, and I would say to them, okay, which recitation? And they'd say, I don't know, what do you mean recitation? Just I want to learn Quran. No, well, you have to choose a particular recitation. The most popular one we have today is Hafsan Asim, right? And most people are not aware that there are actually uh, 20, so 19 other ones besides that one. Um, but uh, in other parts of the world where it's more, it's read more than here, like in the eastern part or in, in the United States, like in Morocco where they read Wersh, and in Libya where they read Qalun, and in Yemen where they read Abi Ahmed, so there's different... So in the same way, I would say in fiqh, if you want to learn fiqh seriously, then try to follow one school. If after you master one school, then it's fine. It's good actually to, to at least be aware of the other opinions. Just like it's good to be aware of other wa ways of reading the Qur'an. Because if you're not aware, then you'll be quick to, to condemn something you haven't heard about, even though it may be valid. So the Maliki Madhab, which we'll be kind of focusing on, um, and the reason we're doing the uh, Maliki Madhab, uh, for no other reason except that's the one that I was trained in. So it's not like it's preferable or it's better or it's any of those things, but this is the one that, uh, that I was trained in, and so we're going to do that. And, you know, usually the, our scholars say the Madhab you should try to follow is the one that's most accessible to you, the one that you can learn. Um, even though there are definitely areas in the world where certain madhahab are dominant, right? So definitely in the subcontinent, I shouldn't call that anymore, the, con the Indian continent, the Orientalist uh, trope. In the Indian continent, um, the Hanafi madhahab is dominant, even though in the coastal areas there is very significant Shafi uh, followers. Uh, in Turkey, uh, Uzbekistan, and the Central Asian republics, also the Hanafi madhahab is very dominant. But you'll find other parts of the world like the Malay Archipelago, which includes Indonesia and, uh, and Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand to some degree. They follow the uh, Shafi school of thought. In West and North Africa, which includes Mali and Senegal and Morocco and Algeria and Tunis, Libya, uh, Sudan, Upper Egypt, they follow the Maliki school of thought. The only one that doesn't really have any significant following anywhere is the Hanbali school. Um, I was always kind of very local. It didn't really spread out that much. So most people, in the Muslims in the world, usually follow one of those three, uh, whether they're aware of it or not. So Imam Malik ibn Anas al-Asbahi, which was his original tribe from Yemen, he was born in 97 um, after the Hijra and died in 179. He is the second oldest of all of the Imams. Imam Abu Hanif was born in 83 of the Hijra and died in 150, the same year that Imam al-Shafir was born, 150 of the Hijra. He was a scholar of both hadith and fiqh. His very famous book, al Muwatta, uh, was probably the first musannaf, probably the first book authored uh, in Islam. Uh, and it was mostly hadith, but also had many of his juristic opinions, a lot of fiqh in it as well. Uh, one of the, there are many outstanding properties or attributes of the madhab. One of them is that it has many juristic principles on which it is based. In other words, Imam Malik took many things into consideration before he would issue a ruling. He even has something called Murat al-Khilaf, which means that he would consider if other people disagreed with him on a particular thing, then he might make a dispensation um, to follow that opinion. Um, and that was kind of the basic adab or etiquette that most of the ulama had with one another. So it never got to be, even their difference of opinion did not lead them to kind of openly condemn or deride someone else. They would have scholarly differences. Imam al-Shafi has a book, uh, a chapter in one of his books called Bab Ikhtilaf Malik, and Malik is his teacher, but that didn't stop him from um, pursuing, in, in perhaps a, in, you know, not a, in a dispassionate way, talking about how he differed from Malik on some of his juristic principles. Um, 
Malik uh, put a lot of emphasis on the Medinian praxis or traditions. So what people did in Medina was very significant for him. He was only uh, two generations removed from the Prophet ﷺ. He studied with 700 or so of the ulama of Medina. And so he considered that their opinions and the practice that was carried on from one generation to the next to be authoritative. While the other schools of thought didn't completely discount that, they didn't give the, the, you know, the kind of uh, authoritativeness that Malik did to the med- traditions of Medina. And that included Imam al-Shafi. So probably the main reason why Imam al-Shafi kind of went off on his own was his disagreement about the Medinian uh, traditions. And Imam al-Shafi had traveled, he had studied in Iraq, he studied in Medina with Malik, and he also went to Egypt later on. Imam Malik, interestingly enough, he never really left Medina. He stayed um, in, uh, in in Medina, and it's only when he went to Hajj in Mecca that he would leave. But nevertheless, his followers, his students, spread out. They went to North Africa, they went to Egypt, they went to Iraq. It was actually, uh, there was a Maliki school in Iraq uh, that survived for quite some time. So there was a lot of influences on what we come to call the dominant rulings today. So even within each school, there could be various opinions, right? And one thing that Imam Sharani points out, for example, is that most of the madhabs, if you find a, a weak opinion in one madhab, it could be the dominant opinion in another. So what they really differ upon is how much credibility they give to each of these rulings. Where you might find something that is the dominant opinion, another one might be a dispensation, right? Imam al says it's recommended to wipe your whole head in wudu, but he doesn't require it. Whereas the Malikiyah require it. So it's a question of what Imam al-Sha'arani called of Ruqsa and Azima. So in his book uh, called Al-Mizan al-Kubra, he talks about this, this theory of his, that it's really based upon Ruqas wa Azayim. It's based upon dispensations or lack thereof. Uh, that's really the main differences between the schools of thought. And that allows kind of the flexibility in, uh, in practice that we see. So um, I will try uh, some degree when something is like... Uh, may be significant to point out where there's a difference of opinion. I might try to point those things out if I'm aware of it. But otherwise, we're going to kind of stick with uh, the dominant opinions within the uh, Maliki school. And even if you're not Maliki, if you're listening to this online or if you're attending, it's knowledge, it's ilm, right? When I was a student in uh, Damascus, I didn't really have access to any Maliki teachers, so I studied the Hanafi school. Um, and I studied even with a private teacher because I wanted to learn it. So... Uh, it's knowledge, and whenever there's an opportunity for knowledge, it's recommended that one avail themselves of it. You know, we should never think of the schools of thought, the madhahib, as um, something that you identify with, right? Because we don't want to lead to this type of ideological tribalism that is so much in vogue today. You know, I'm Maliki, I'm Shafi, I'm Hanafi, I'm Kedah. The only thing that you say is I'm Muslim, right? We don't kind of put these labels upon people and, you know, as a means of, of division. Right? When you say someone is medic, you saying it's like saying, you know, I went to uh, Muhlenberg, and he went to um, Lafayette, and he went to Lehigh, and he went to Harvard. It's just, you know, the school that, where you may study, but it's not a reason for to have this sort of rivalry and, and divisive kind of rhetoric that goes back and forth uh, between people, right? If you're medic or you're Shafi or Hanafi, it doesn't mean that all the books that you read and all those people that you study with should only be medic or Shafi, right? Right? Um, some of the greatest uh, ulama, you know, they would study their fiqh with someone of that school, but that doesn't mean they couldn't study tafsir or hadith or Sufism or any other topic with someone of another school. In fact, they never made that distinction. That wasn't something that was a barrier. They didn't say they have to be this. You know, if someone followed a particular way in, in tasawwuf, like a qadri or raf or rifai or shatari, they didn't say only these teachers and then at the exclusion of all else. So al amru wasa, right? It's... There's a lot of flexibility in it, and we should never put it as kind of barriers between us and knowledge, and, and, and gaining that knowledge. So just a couple of cursory things that we need to do beforehand, to, uh, before we jump right into it. The five legal rulings that many of us probably already aware with, aware of. In the Maliki Madhab, slight differences in some things. Um, so fard and wajib, which means that which is obligatory, that which you do, which is defined as that if you do it, 
Allah will reward you for it, and if you uh, leave it off, then you'll be taken into account. So in the Maliki school, Fard and Wajib are synonymous, unlike the Hanafi school, which makes a distinction. Hanafi school, uh, the Fard is that which is obligatory based upon a uh, unequivocal source like the Qur'an, and the Wajib is based upon something that's vanni or equivocal like some of the Hadith. But this sort of epistemological difference, the other schools of thought don't consider that when in their nomenclature and what they name. So Fard and Wajib are the same, except when we talk about Hajj, where there is some difference between Fard and Wajib. So in Hajj we say Fard or Ruk, or something essential, which means that if you uh, don't do it, then your Hajj is, um, is not Hajj. You have to do it over completely. Whereas a Wajib is something, if you leave it out, it can be expiated by slaughtering an animal. Uh, and we'll get to that when we get to Hajj. Um, sunnah. Uh, Imam Malik, he had kind of some divisions within Sunnah. So, Sunnah in general is a category, but underneath Sunnah, we can think of Sunnah as, um, he didn't use the word Sunnah, Mu'akkada, or confirm Sunnah, but when he said Sunnah, he means something in the highest caliber. In other words, something that the Prophet them used to always do and normally would not leave out. Like the Shafa and Witr prayer, that would be considered Sunnah. Salat al Eidain, the two Eid, the prayers of the two Eids are considered Sunnah. Uh, whereas other things, other types of prayers, can be in al Mandub. Mandub is a lower category. Mandub would be things like uh, the Rawatib, you know, praying two or four rakahs before Dhuhr or after Dhuhr or two or four before Asr. These would be al Mandubat, recommended things. Because in Malik's opinion, the Prophet وسلم, sometimes performed them, sometimes he didn't. So he wasn't as consistent in performing them in front of people at least as what we would call the sunnah then he had an in-between category called the raghiba and there's only one thing that falls in that which is the two rakahs before the morning prayer which is called fajr so in, in the Maliki terminology subah prayer is the fard is the obligatory thing and then the fajr which we call fajr nowadays but fajr is actually the sunnah or raghiba prayers that come right before the uh, the, the, the obligatory prayer, which we'll get to when we talk about prayer anyway. But other than that, everything else would be in one of those three categories, or one of those two, namely Sunnah or al mandub Al-Mubah is that which is merely permissible. In other words, the Sharia is not telling you you have a particular opinion about it, but as we say, uh, our adat, we should make them ibadat, that our habitual things that are merely permissible, we can make them into... Uh, devotional acts by our intention so intention can make something from merely permissible to something that is uh, meritorious al makru which is something that is disliked is that which is better to leave off but if you choose to do it anyway then it is not in the same category as the haram you're not taking into account for it but it's something better to leave out and makru actually means something that is detested reprehensible. So I think most serious people should endeavor to avoid the makruh like they avoid, they endeavor to avoid the haram. And in fact the Sahaba didn't make a big distinction, distinction between these two things. Um, when the Prophet said them, told them don't do this, they didn't ask is that makruh or haram? As long as he said don't do it then you know we don't do it. Then the haram obviously is that which very clearly the Prophet said them, said don't do this and also indicating that um, it's not merely makruh, but it's something to be avoided completely. So most books of fiqh, they start talking, they start off with uh, prayer, right? Because the prayer is umud al It is the pillar of the deen. And it's kind of the dividing line between people who are serious and people who are not serious. Um, so people cannot pray for various reasons. They can pray because they cannot uh, or avoid the prayer because they're lazy or they feel it doesn't give them the fulfillment that they want, so forth, those reasons. That's one category by itself. And then there are people who don't pray because they don't feel that is actually part of Islam. If they're of the latter category, then we say, that which you're practicing right now, it's not Islam. There is no Islam without prayer. If you, if you deny it and say it's not part of Islam, then you're practicing another religion which you're free to do, but it's not Islam. Um, so we don't have this concept of, as I talked about last Tuesday, of Islams, that Islam is whatever you make it out to be. 
Any individual can, is there free to define what Islam is. It doesn't work like that. Um, we have a tradition that has been preserved that uh, many, many men and women, scholars over, over many generations, you know, um, spent their whole lives trying to preserve it, trying to teach it, trying to transmit it. And it's a consensus of all of them that we do have this entity called Islam. And it's defined in these terms. And that if you want to go against that and you want to do something different, fine. But don't call it Islam anymore. It's not Islam. <coughs> so the, the prayer is something that is integral to that. Um, the prayer has conditions. And so amongst these conditions for its validity is something called tahara or purity. So that's usually the first thing that you'll find in any book of fifth talks about purity and the different types of purity. Uh, one of the first verses revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, Surah Al-Muzzamil, wa thiyabaka fatahir, right? And even though the Prophet ﷺ, his clothes are pure, and he's pure, but nevertheless the command was issued as a commandment to the Ummah, right? As a, to all Muslims in general, not just to specifically to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Tahara is of, main, of two main types in terms of ritual devotions, namely Taharat al Khabath wa Taharat al Hadath. So Al Khabath means physical purity, which we'll get to in a second, and Al Hadath means ritual purity. And you need to fulfill both of them in order to perform the prayer. Um, this word Tahara is the same word that we use when we talk about Taharat al Nafs or Taharat al Ruh, spiritual purity. And I said, as before, there's a link between the two. So one can't really claim uh, spiritual purity without really having the physical and ritual purities as well. Right? So we couldn't just approach the prayer and say, well, you know, I'm pure inside, so it doesn't matter, I'll just go pray. Um, but rather, the enlightenment of the ritual and physical purity will enlighten the spirit. Right? The Prophet said, he described people in the next life when he says that the, you know, the, the nur or the light that comes from their ritual purity will appear in the next life. Ghurr al-Muhajjirin, right? al muhajjirin he talks about this whiteness of their limbs. Amakin al wudu So those places where they were making wudu will appear this kind of beaming type of white light uh, in the next life. So there's a connection between the spiritual purity and the physical and ritual purity. And obviously the acts that we do in Tahara, you know, they're very specific, you know, of washing the face and washing the arms and the feet and, and wiping the hair, right? It's not haphazard. There's a very specific nature to it. And the reason for that is each one of those limbs is involved in some type of sinning or iniquity. And, you know, when the Prophet Sallallahu told the Sahaba, he said, if you're st sitting by or standing by a river and every time you got dirty, you wash yourself in the river you would be very clean. You know, would you not be so clean? And they said, well, in the wudu, you have the opportunity to do that five times a day. So all of the sins that the eyes have seen, all of the sins that have done by the striking of the hand or where you walk to, all of these things can be expiated and expunged by virtue of the wudu. So the wudu is an ibadah, it's a devotional act. Even though it's a condition for prayer, it's an act of itself as well. So physical purity, right, and this is important when we talk about Taharat al-Khabath, because these things have to be off of our person. If they're najas, that means we can't pray with them on us. Somehow we have to wash them off, which I'll get to in a little bit. So at tahir what are the things that are pure, what are the things that are impure? Purity and impurity is not about what I find disgusting or what I find not disgusting. It doesn't have anything to do with that, even though there's some correlation, obviously. But... It has to do with what the Sharia designates as Tahir versus what is not Tahir. So in the Maliki school, all living beings are Tahir, in other words, pure, including swine and canines, pigs and dogs. Um, and that also includes the things that, um, that come out of the, the secretions other than the, the, the rear and front orifice, other than the anus and the front, then everything that comes out of those animals is also pure. So like the saliva of a dog in the Maliki school is tahir, it's pure. 
So if it gets on you, you walk down the street, the dog licks your hand, don't have, you know, a cow, it's fine. You don't have to make wudu. You don't have to wash it off. Just go pray. You could be praying and he's licking you the whole time and it's perfectly fine. <laughs> perfectly fine in the medic school. Now, whether you can own a dog or not is a separate question. People get those two confused. Oh, if that, well, if that's the case, then I can obviously have a dog in the house and so forth, which it's a separate question. There's a difference of opinion about it and, and so forth. But the idea that the mere licking of the dog is to make you impure, no, that's not true. Even in the other schools of thought, right, there is no school of thought that says that the dog licking you, you have to renew your wudu. It doesn't do that. All it is is the moisture that got on your hand, you wash it off. That's it. The hadith about wudu al kalb, you know, the dog who, who licks from the bowl, even that is what we call ta'abudi, right? Because, yes, the dog licked from the bowl and you wash it seven times and last time with, eighth time with dirt. Um, it doesn't say that for the pig. And for many of us, the pig is more najas, you know, more impure than, than the dog. But you don't have to do that with the pig. So the Malikis, they said that's ta'abud. In other words, this is something, a, a ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it doesn't have sort of any practical consideration for it. We just do it because Allah said for us to do it. Right? But it doesn't mean that the bowl has become najas. That's what they mean. So that means that if I were to drink out of a bowl that it draw, drank out of, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, um, you'll find uh, with cats, for example, there's no difference of opinion. So al hirra, you know, what, what the cat licks or out of a bowl, a human being has no issues. That's not najas. It's not considered to be najas. Because the saliva of the animal is pure. Now, from a, a, a medicinal standpoint about, you know, is that healthy or not? I'm not here to answer that. But I'm just talking about, um, you know, even though there's that very famous trope that, you know, the dog's saliva is better than the human or something like that. Is that what doctors say? It has fewer germs or something like that. Something you used to hear. Huh? Cats. Cats? Okay. Anyway, so the thought had all living beings, including swine, canines, uh, all of those things are tahir, which would include their saliva uh, and their mucus and their tears and their eggs. All ritually slaughtered animals that are permissible to eat the meat of them, right? So that would include um, anything that you're allowed to eat, which would be. Uh, Cows and any derivative of a cow, which includes buffalo, water buffalo, uh, sheep, goats, uh, camels, and anything like a camel, like a llama. Um, all of those things would be allowed to be eaten. So if you slaughter them, then their meat would be uh, tahir and not najas. But if an animal is impermissible to eat, even if you slaughter it ritually, then one is not allowed to, uh, then it's, it's meat and its skin still remains najas, like a bear or a lion or something like that, which we would not be allowed to eat, even if you were able to slaughter it, which I don't see how you could, um, or to hunt it, then uh, it would not be uh, considered tahir, if it's dead. The urine and feces of animals that are permissible to eat and this is something unique to the Maliki school, uh, is considered to be pure. So, uh, and this helps with people, especially if they're around farm animals a lot. Um, so the, uh, you know, urine and feces of a cow or of a goat or of a camel, any of those animals that were allowed to eat, if they were to get on your clothing or the bottom of your, you know, trousers or dungarees or something, then um, that's not considered to be najas. It's considered to be pure. Other animals, no, but the farm animals are animals that are allowed to eat. Um, so that doesn't include donkey and horse. Those things, their, their excretions are, are considered to be nudges. But animals that are allowed to eat are considered to be pure. Um, the Medicaid school doesn't make uh, a distinction. Uh, yeah, what about uh, the... Um, uh, urine and feces of human beings in general, urine and feces of human beings, as you see, anything not permissible to eat would be najas. It's considered to be impure. Anything that um, 
is not one of those animals that was promiscuous. So human beings, whether babies or not babies. So not just things, impure things, all dead animals, not ritually slaughtered, except human beings. Right, so even a dead body of a human being is not considered to be najas. Um, even though the, the excretions of it, yes. The urine and feces of animals not permissible to eat, right, including human beings, would also be considered to be najas. So if donkey, horse, dog, uh, pig, all of those things would be najasa. And then for human beings also, all bodily secretions emitted from the front or rear orifices, which we're going to go into some detail. Spiritual purity, which is related to this, right? So just like Tarat al Khabat is removing these impurities, spiritual purity is a manifestation of ritual purity. So there are certain things that are like Najaset, like impurities within the soul, right? So just like you wouldn't approach the prayer with having these things on your person, you also you wouldn't have greed, envy, avarice, you know, Su'udvan, unjustified suspicion within one also when you try to approach the prayer, or even. There's no distinction between the prayer and outside of the prayer, right? Just like if you want to have a hudur and reverence and awareness within the prayer, if you don't have it outside of the prayer, that's why you don't have it in the prayer. That's really the secret, right? When people, when they say, I just, you know, I'm not feeling it in a prayer, because, because you're not feeling it anywhere else, right? So the prayer is kind of a, a, a microcosm of the macrocosm, and the macrocosm is what you do everything in life. So if you have hudur in life outside of the prayer, you will find it within the prayer. And if you don't, you won't. So physical purity of the limbs removes the sins committed by them and enlightens their movement, and in turn, enlightens the heart. Just bear with us, perhaps. Computer's not uh, responding. Computer's not responding. Yeah. I can just read off. Okay. Yeah, that's, I think we'll just continue with the live class.
a direct HDMI port mm -hmm. from this to HDMI. That makes mm -hmm. it much more fun to use. Okay. That'll be easy. Mm -hmm. There's no issues, right? It's just for the... Just the computer. So what do we do? No, the computer completely froze. What about the live stream? Yeah, yeah froze. Froze. I think what we're doing, we should maybe just get a dedicated one for Saki that has nothing else on it. For the, um, the laptop. Pakistanis, you know the confusion they get with the word Mathab. Because in Urdu, Mathab means religion. So they don't use Deen in Urdu. So if somebody's listening on live stream or even over here, I know there are people who are going to be thinking, I know there are people who when you say Mathab, they think uh, religion. So in Pakistan, that's what creates a lot of issues because they say, oh, this mother, that mother, they say, oh, why, why can't we have just, we have just one mother, that's Islam. That's the, they get into these debates all the time, I still remember that. <laughs> Do you want to keep it on for the questions as well? Or? Presentation is available, but this is um, it's, like it's going to take a minute. It takes some seconds to reload it. What is your Wi-Fi link? Yeah. What's the speed? Um, I'm not sure, but it's. 
stronger than the room. The room has a Wi-Fi link, but it's just strong than the door. Yeah, it's restarted. What? Between a what? A cat and a dog breeding. Well, since then, they can't. They, they, they can't. Found one. They found one in China recently. Nah. Well, when you have one, then, then you come ask the question. <laughs> We're just trying to do kind of the hypotheticals, that's all. You're in the wrong class. <laughs> Medicates don't do hypotheticals. <laughs> <laughs> when you land on the moon, don't worry about it. No, they found one. It's not. I'm not, I'm not just making this up. They actually yeah. found a. They crossbred, or the animal yeah. ha looks like something yeah, they like. Cross -bred. I don't know about that. Um, so, are we I, up? We're not on the live stream, although what we can do is um, we can at least do audio from the live stream okay. from my computer. It, it reaches you. So All right. It's worth it. Thank you. Should I continue? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry for that slight technical disruption. Hopefully, we'll get the kinks out of the system by next week. So as you mentioned, spiritual purity um, cannot be realized without following the Sharia, and that includes following the idea of approaching the prayer, not just from a physical and ritual purity aspect, but also as a means to attain spiritual purity. And you will realize the spiritual benefits of the prayer when you're able to avail yourself that outside of the prayer as well. So the Siyat in Nefs it's not just about what you do in the prayer, but actually what you do outside of the prayer. That's why many of the ulama, they recommend even for one to be in a state of ritual purity all the time. Sayyidina Bilal ibn Rabah, he would, whenever he would lose his wudu, he would renew it, and he would also pray to Rakaz, and the Prophet ﷺ approved of that, uh, of that action from him. Wudu silah al-mu'min, that wudu is the weapon of the believer because he puts you in a state where you're able to fend off your nafs and your ego and the shaitan and the dunya uh, in a better way than not being in a state of wudu. Many of the ulama I, you know, that we've come across, they would never leave the house except being in a state of wudu. And even inside the house, I mean, they would try to automatically uh, renew it when they had the opportunity. And I think we sh that's, uh, <coughs> that's kind of not so difficult to do. Um, we don't realize it, but we have easy access to water and running water at that and heated water at that you know all the reasons you can think of why you wouldn't renew your wudu when you have the chance are not really you know applicable to us because it's neither too cold it's available you know um, so I think it's a sunnah that uh, it's highly recommended so speaking of water which we call purifying agent or al-mutahir, al-mutahir, which means what types of, what are the attributes of water that need to be there for us to use it to, in wudu or in ghusl. So any naturally occurring water uh, is valid. So that would include well water, river and sea water, rain water, melted snow, well water, you know, aquifers underneath the ground, all of those things. And the salt in the sea water doesn't matter. You can still actually make wudu with, with that type of water since it's naturally occurring. Um, water that runs over, like river water, but a stream, and there's some <coughs> sediments from what it runs over from the, uh, from the river bed, that also doesn't invalidate it. The water is still good, is fine to use. If you introduce these elements, however, into the water afterwards, and they're not naturally occurring, then this does affect the water. Right, so if you were to, um, you know, if you took the, uh, you're at Sea World and uh, you need wudu and Shamu is in his big Sea World tank and you happen to be sitting in the splash zone in the front 
and then he splashes you, right, and all the water comes on you, that water is not naturally occurring seawater. That is actually water that they saltified, is that right? So it's not, you couldn't make wudu without water because it was introduced to it. However, it's naturally occurring, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, all of that is fine because it's naturally occurring. So the distinction between naturally occurring versus not naturally occurring. Um, some people might ask, well, what about the water that runs through our pipes? Don't they add fluoride and things and stuff like this too? In that case, it would be akin to something naturally occurring. In other words, it's too difficult to remove. So something where it's as if it was naturally occurring, you don't really have the ability otherwise, right? then that water would be legitimate for you to make wudu with. So if something of the water that runs in uh, you know, the pipe water, <clears throat> then they have some added elements to it to purify it or fluoride or something like that, then this is fine to, to make wudu with. Doesn't include coconut water, watermelon water. These are types of water, but they're not uh, what's called ma al mutlaq, unqualified. In other words, there's no kind of you don't have, you don't put an adjective in front of it. So water is just water. Uh, also includes any water where adulterating agents are difficult to avoid, as I mentioned, such as river water tinged by minerals or treated tap water. Water that has been impinged by some impurity, najasa such as that the smell, taste, or color has been altered is not permissible to use to use for purification or everyday use. So, um, if uh, you, you have like a big barrel of water and something went in there and urinated in it, like a rodent, a mouse, or something, raccoon got to it, um, such as that one of the three properties is changed. So you smell it, doesn't smell like water anymore, or you physically you look at it, and it's, the color is different. Or if you put it on your tongue and it tastes a little different, any one of those three, let alone all three or two of the three, then in this case you would not be allowed to use that water. However, if you have such a volume of water that you know, the one drop of najasa doesn't affect it, then you're still allowed to use that water. Um, for wudu, let's say it's not water, let's say it's like um, uh, uh, seminal or, 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 or ghee or something like that, you know, shortening, which is semi-liquid, um, or honey, right, which is thick enough. So, if, for example, um, you know, as we said, live animals are not najas, but dead animals are. So if like a, a, a mouse were to fall into your honey jar, so it's not the actual, you know, when it dies, it, something may have come out of it to affect it. But if it can be localized and you can cut around it, such as that the rest is not affected, then it's fine to use the rest of it. Some of you might say, yeah, I mean, if a mouse falls into my honey jar, I'm not having any of that honey. And this is, you know, I'm getting rid of that thing. And that's a very nice luxury to have, right? But fit is for everybody, right? And all different circumstances. So if... Many people are, don't have, you know, the, the luxury of getting rid of everything, right? Even water. Even water. They don't have the luxury of just saying, oh, okay, just dump the whole thing. You know, they, they need to make use of what they have. Not to mention that, نَحْنُ مُقْتَصِدِينَ يعني we, we make use of that thing which is there that's available to use. So even though we might feel a little bit, you know, lack of affinity for that thing, but that doesn't render it unusable. So in this case, we would do our best to, uh, to try to cut around it and, and you know, not throw the whole thing out. Uh, water that has been altered by a pure substance in one of the three aforementioned properties is permissible for everyday use, but not for ritual purification. So that means if your water set aside and some milk fell into it or oil, you know, or something, and it got mixed into it, such as one of the three properties has changed, it's fine to use. You can still cook with it. You can still do, you know, wash pots with it or something like that. But you cannot use it as wudu. Right? However, if none of the three properties are changed, then it's perfectly fine to, to use as wudu. The Hanafi school, I believe, will say you have to have most of the properties changed. So... For them, it's a little bit easier. So if one of the properties only changed, only changed then they would consider, consider that to be 
uh, valid to use, but if most of the properties, in other words, two out of three, then at that point they would say you can't use it anymore. And we are just about over time. Uh, let's just get to the removing impurities part. So what is it about Najasat impurities? They must be removed before prayer. Three places, one's body, one's clothing, and one's place of prayer. So the body means anywhere on your skin. Or it could actually mean something that's attached to you and moves with you. One of the examples they use in some of the fiqh books is if you are at the docks and um, you, don't want, you don't have anything to tie your boat to, so you tie it around yourself, but at the same time you need to pray, then uh, if there's something that's just in the boat and it moves as you move, right, then that would not be legitimate. So you'd have to untie it to something else. Uh, or if you're carrying a child who has a, a dirty diaper, then that too would be invalid because they're moving as you're moving. And probably in the Maliki Methab, it would be considered... You couldn't probably pray with a child, carrying a child, because it would be extraneous movement and distracting. But even if we were to say that it's valid to do that, if the, if the child has something in the diaper, then we would say, uh, because of Nenejasa, that's on your person, because it's moving with your, with your movement. So on one's body, on one's clothing, right? Um, something in Nenejasa is on your clothing. Uh, blood is Nenejasa, we didn't mention that, but, you know, a blood that is more than, like, a half-dollar size worth. Uh, on your, or if it's spread out, or even in one place, then this would be considered najasa. So you'd have to change your clothing or to uh, wash it out. Um, the fifth makes dispensations, though, for people who are in difficult situations. So they would say, for example, the murda'a, the nursing mother, who might have you know baby regurgitation on her clothing and she doesn't have a change of clothes. Then there's kind of leniency with this. But it's always better to set aside separate clothes. Or the butcher, it's recommended that um, they have separate clothes for praying in because all of the blood that's on them would be considered to be uh, najasa. One's place of prayer, specifically where one touches the ground, uh, in other words, where you're standing with your feet, or when you're in prostration, sujood, where you're touching with your seven limbs, with your hands, your knees, your forehead, and your nose, then these things have to be removed from the jasa. Technically, that means that in that space between your arms and your knees, if there's something in the jasa there and you're not touching it, it doesn't really affect your prayer. Um, alternately, you can put a mat over it, as long as you're not coming to direct contact uh, with it. That would include your shoes. It's okay to pray in your shoes, but if there's najas on the bottom of them and you're standing on that, then you have to remove your shoes. How do we remove impurities if they're there? From the body, we must wash them off until all remaining residue is removed by, by washing, obviously. Uh, to remove impurities from clothing, the item must be washed by rubbing until the rinsed water is free of impurities. In other words, I have a, a dirty shirt, and I wash it, and then when I do this, when I rinse it, the water that comes out, if that doesn't have any of the uh, remnants of the najasa, then it's considered to be clean. Even if the original stain remains, right? Because sometimes you can't get that out, like blood stains and certain things. Once it's there, it's very difficult to remove. But once you, if you're rinsing it and it and it comes out, the water comes out clear, and there's nothing changed by it, then at that point, it's, uh, it's fine to pray with. To remove impurities from one's place of prayer, the ground or floor must be sprayed with water, what we call a nala, or rush, uh, over it. That's it. There's no, like, obviously you can't rinse the ground or anything like this, unless it's like a carpet or a rug that you can do that with. But other than that, uh, that would, that's all that would be required uh, to do that. So we'll stop here uh, for today's session, and we can take questions. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, for, for finding the ground where we pray, uh, does, does sun also work? I mentioned it, but it's not a different um, That, for example, if a rug has some No, because the sun is not going to remove whatever, if it was liquid and it got onto it, it's not going to go away until you actually wash it. Right? So something that can be washed, the general rule is if it can be washed, 
you have to wash it. If you can't wash it, then you do what's called nada, or you spray water on it, yeah. which is kind of more, it's not really going to get it clean, but it's the idea that, you know, you, at least you did something to, uh, to that thing before you pray on it. From the body. Uh, so just from the body, not the water or whatever you have. No, this is when you're removing from your body. If there's najas on your body, like blood or something, then you have to do it until it's off here. Yeah. Because it's in the same school. What we say in the Maliki school, sometimes on rare occasions you have what's called mashuran, two opinions that are dominant. In that case, it's valid to, to follow either of the two opinions. Can you do it in the same salat? Yes. Okay. Especially when it's hayat, when it's you know, a lot of people make a big deal about yes. Maliki's praying, you know, with their hands down or their hands up like this. Th that particular issue takes about one line from you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of fiqh. That's how important it was. But in this age of uh, madahir, of, you know, only thinking about things that are apparent, that's what everybody gets, you know, hooked up on. But it's not a big deal. It's just a minor issue. Anyone else? Anything online? I had two questions online, actually. Um, of course, we can answer them a little time. The first, under advanced question, what are the conditions mentioned uh, for talfiq? What's the second question? Uh, where is Khilaf al awla or Khilaf al huda mentioned or placed amongst the five rulings? Where is Khilaf al awla or Khilaf al huda Time delay. Um, the first question was about uh, the conditions for Talfiq. Yes. Um, what are the conditions mentioned for Talfiq? As long as the, the, the basic entity integral of the ibadah is valid on a school, right? So the, 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 the two situations I mentioned, and usually the Malikis, they talk about لا يجوز التلفيق في الحدث ولا في الزواج. So it's not allowed to do it in things of ritual purity and in things relating to marriage, right? But in other situations, some transactional things, then they're much more lenient than the other schools of thought. The other schools of thought actually would be less lenient. They would say no, some of them say no talfi at all. And uh, the second question, Khilaf al-Awla, the Malikis don't really have that category. That's something specific to the Shafi'is. Um, you know, for example, a Shafi'i would say, if you live in Mecca, then it would be Khilaf awla not to make Hajj every year if you're a resident of Mecca. Where the Malikis would probably put that in something along the lines of makruh. You know, because Khilaf Awla and Makruh are very closely related, but the Shafi'i has kind of made that distinction of something normally you should always be doing, so it would be Khilaf Awla, Awla not to do that. But that particular term, only I, from what I'm aware of, the later Malikis might have used it, but in a general sense, not in a specific fifth tense that uh, the Shafi'i school uses. It. So it's Makruh in the Maliki method to make Hajj every year if you live in Mecca? No, if, to not make it. Not make Hajj. Right. I haven't seen that particular mas'ala. I, I haven't seen them say, if you live in Mecca, then... But the Shafi's pointed it out, and they said that would be khilaf, khilaf awla. Yes? Regarding the jihad, the jihad is that each person can do it with jihad, or, or, no. or, or has to be there? Uh, it takes certain, certain... Not everyone can do it with jihad. People don't have the time or the aptitude to do it. So then they follow one of the schools, which is... 99.999% of people, basically, um, to do that. And obviously there are varying levels. At more advanced students will not just, you know, we don't really have this thing called following blindly. People make that claim all the time, like, oh, you're blindly following Malik or Hana Abu Hanifa. Or Blindly following means that, you know, I have my eyes covered and uh, I don't know what's in front of me and I'm just following them. And I don't know who they are, what they're doing, or where they're going. That's not the case here. Right? We're not blindly following anybody. These are authoritative imams, right? That the ummah, the consensus of the ummah upon them for hundreds, a millennium or more. 
So there's no blind following here whatsoever, right? Blind following is when you go on Google and you look someone up and you find his YouTube video and he says nonsense like that on his YouTube video and then you say, oh, he's very eloquent. I think I'm going to follow him. No, that's blind following, right? That's stupid following. But what we're talking about is something that has been confirmed, has been muharrar, has been assessed, evaluated, back and forth, forwards and backwards, left and right, up and down, for hundreds and thousands of years. So there's no blind following. And more advanced students will be able to know some of the juristic reasoning behind why the opinions are there. And then the ulama of our era, you know, the ones that, who, who still follow a school of thought, but what they do when al mustajidat when new things come up, right, they're able to look at the different juristic methodologies and, you know, sort of take all that in consideration when they want to issue a particular ruling, right? So, um, you know, this is what's safe. This is what's, I think, um, solid. You know, if you want to do something else and you want to, you know, follow any of, of the pundits and these nonsensical people who, you know, who, who don't have you know, the, the least qualification, then people are free to do that. But I think, you know, this is deen. Uh, Imam Malik said, you know, look to where you're taking your deen from, right? And we're taking our deen from something that we have complete confidence in. So. Uh, actually, certain thing I would like to ask about this. Uh, like when you pray in the airplane, when you do like 30 hours flight, you know, like, so all this asad, the world, is the time change. Like, what? That particular question about prayer and praying on a plane is going to come up when we talk about prayer. Uh, but as a general rule, we pray according, in terms of the prayer times, to where we are, not where we're coming from or where we're going. Well, some people erroneously, they said, yeah, I just left New York and I'm heading towards... Uh, Peshawar or something, and so I'm going to, you know, pray according to the Peshawar time, even though I'm in the middle of the Atlantic and the sun hasn't set yet, and then you pray Maghrib, it doesn't work. It's, it's where you are. So that, it's difficult when you're flying on a plane, but it's not impossible. And if one fails to do that during when flying on the plane, at the very least they have to make it up when they land, you know, and that's all. So... جزاكم الله خير بارك الله فيكم أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يوفقنا جميعا لطاعة الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأن يظلمنا الرشد والصواب والإلهام وأن يبارك لنا في هذه الأيام المباركات المعلومات There's only a few days left in the Hijjah These are very blessed days We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to increase us and to give us himma and aspiration to seek his pleasure during these days and to lift the difficulties and afflictions that are besieging our ummah uh, now everywhere they may be and that he give us the uh, ability to recognize the, the many, many blessings he has given us and uh, that we, this recognition of blessings culminates in the day of Eid and that we all gather for the day of Eid and we recognize these blessings and that Allah grant us the greatest blessing of pronouncing on our last breath, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen